Um, the reason we're having this issue briefing on uh, illegal fishing is because the forum has done a significant amount of work with our stakeholders on uh, introducing technology, working to introduce technology between business, government and civil society on tracking fish stocks and managing the, uh, the illegal fishing challenge, which is a huge uh, issue. Uh, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing represents theft of around 26 million tonnes or $26 billion uh, of value of seafood a year. It's a hugely challenging issue that, uh, that runs across the supply chain. Uh, today we will have a perspective from, uh, from Timor Leste, uh, from a minister who has a deep understanding of uh, illegal fishing issues. Uh, in Southeast Asia and how governments uh, and uh, business are working together to solve that. And from Peter, a uh, perspective on the challenges of human trafficking in the illegal fishing industry. Uh, and so with that, I'll hand over to Minister De Silva for some statements on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us here. And then uh, the issue, the illegal fishing, is a global issue. In our days, when resources from from the earth is getting scarce, we turn into sea. Um, that's why we have um, last year I took part in an international meeting on blue economy. And then next month I'll travel to with my colleague, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Minister of Environment we will go to New York for a conference, also an international conference on the, on the blue ocean and blue economy, which is a very important. So uh, it's an issue, an issue of uh, a great importance for Timor Leste, because Timor Leste is an island. Not only this, and then we lie between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. Apart from this, and the most important thing is that in Timor-Leste, we lie in a region in the, what we call the Triangle of Baha'i Biodiversity. So any the illegal fishing activities will endanger these species, will endanger what we've seen. We can be, it can be seen as, a, as world heritage, what we need to protect. Uh, and what everyone, and then also, because of the climatic changes, some tough action needs to be taken in order for us to protect those species. Not only some of them are in danger, but also we need to protect the resources for our own people and for the for 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 human consumption. In terms of uh, for Timor Leste, it's very important as uh, the protein intake in Timor Leste is one of the issue. So we need to to do it. So what we we have in Timor Leste, we promote a sustainable fishing. We have done, we carried out several studies, coastal studies, coastal fisheries, and then also we promote a sustainable fishing. Our fishing policy is very clear that we do fish, but do it in such a way. Do, we do fishing. We promote fishing, but fishing has to be done in such a way not to deplete the resources. And uh, that's why our, our legal framework in Timor Leste is very tough. We don't. Anyone who wants to invest in the fishing industry, as we currently have already, $100 million investment of industrial fishing that uh, already started last year. They are not, they don't, they're not, they are not only fish in the high sea, in Timor Leste's water, but also they are going to do what we call, what is known as a open sea aquaculture or mariculture. Apart from them, they also do prawn farming. But in regard to the fishing, Anyone who wants to, because we are 
mindful of what could happen. Whoever wants a vision demon have to fulfill some prerequisite. First of all, you have to submit. As for how many, we do license. Our license is, is renewable every year. You don't have license for five years. So any license can be terminated if they are found, they are caught of violating our regulation. The, the, the regulations cover the amount of fish they're allowed to take. Yes, the, the, amount, the amount of fish and what you call the company catch. So if they fish tuna, they are allowed to fish only 10% of other species. If they, caught, they are caught fishing over this, they will be penalized. If they fish the protected species, we give them money. First, second, third is to get out of Timor Leste. Last year, or the year before last year, I did it myself. I canceled two fishing vessels from Sri Lanka. They went there to fish shark instead of fishing tuna and other pelagic species. We came to the first one, and the second one, the third was to get out of Timor Leste. And I have no, we don't sell our resources, our sovereignty, and this is very important. We got them out. So, this, so our regulation is very tough. Any fishing vessel, they have to submit the fishing vessel, and we verify the fishing vessel where, when it was, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the registration, when it was manufactured, which year, and then the registration, and where they have been fishing. And to do so, we cross-check it. We have a very good net network. We cross-check all the vessels, the data. And we send it to our neighbors, Indonesia, Australia, and PNG. And then once it is clear, they can bring the fishing vessel to Timor-Leste, and the fishing vessel is checked. Inspected. And then every fishing equipment will be inspected one by one. But we don't do it ourselves. We ask for Australia and Indonesia and PNG to help. Last time, the Australian sent two officials to help us inspect the fishing. And then they are authorized to do, use a certain fishing device. Trolling is not allowed. Drifting, drifting net is not allowed. If they are caught to use it, they will be heavily penalized. The penalty is from 500 to $500,000. And how well coordinated across the region do you feel uh, fishing, fishing as an industry is? Oh, we, have, we coordinate very well. We've signed an MOU with Indonesia, with Indonesian Minister Susi. And we are about to, uh, we may, we will meet soon to go into practical aspect of implementing this, this MOU. We also uh, work very closely with Australia. As a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, our resources, uh, Australia is willing to provide us with the resources to control illegal fishing, as well as China also, also already promised and Indonesia said that they can help. But above all, we have a, we have a launch in Timor-Leste. No, in Timor-Leste, not only Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste, Australia, PNG, Indonesia. We have what we call Arafura Timor Sea Forum. I'm one of the founding member. member. We also signed the PMC. It's a South China, South China Sea something on fisheries. I went to, I went to Hainan province in 2005 to sign that agreement. And then, above, uh, apart from this, we have uh, ratified FIO conventions on fishing. So all these have been adopted, and they work very closely with Indonesia. So, and, uh, and then we check the company profile. And the company profile is sent to Indonesia, Australia, PNG, and Indonesia. If they are caught to fishing illegally, they are not allowed to fish in Timor-Leste. 
And this is uh, where we And then, of course, illegal fishing in Timor Leste, in Arafura, Timor Sea, and in Timor Sea itself. Um, we have been uh, robbed, I'd say, by the illegal fishing. Now the legal fishing activity is diminishing now because we have uh, our presence in the sea with those uh, 15 fishing boats. Now we increase it to 17. We are very cautious. We, we don't give license, too many licenses, and we don't expect to give too many licenses because we are mindful of the legal fishing activities. There is another aspect of our regulation. Transshipment is not allowed. Every fishing boat that left the port they have to come back within a certain, certain period of time. And within a certain period of time, when they come back, the, the boat will be inspected and the catch will be inspected as well. So there, there are some of the measures that we have taken to combat illegal fishing. Thank but of course, it's still a very young country. We don't have a, enough resources to, to fully control illegal fishing activities, but we're doing our best. At the moment, we have a, a cooperation, close cooperation with the Japan, particularly through JICA, in which gives us access how we can more monitor those vessels that are fishing in Timor Leste Sea. We have around 75,000 square kilometer of fishing, fishing, and then they can only fish 10 miles off the coast, industrial fishing. 10 miles through the coast, it's only for traditional fishing. And they are not allowed to fish in the northern coast. It's for only for coastal fishing. So we, we've done in a, things in a such a way that will protect not only our, our coastal fisheries, but also in order to minimize the impact of intensive fishing uh, uh, and, uh, and depleting our, our resources. We still have some species. Yes. It in some areas already been uh, extinguished, like Nautilus. We have lots of Nautilus in Timor, in Timor Let's see. Yeah. Anyways, um, I'd like to bring in uh, our other participant, Peter, on the on the the human trafficking as trafficking aspects of the of the fishing industry. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, about some of the things that your organisation is working to achieve in in this space? Thanks, Mike. And let me first. Um, just congratulate the World Economic Forum on the leadership that's been shown towards addressing this issue of illegal fishing. Um, I think the multi-stakeholder effort is, uh, is so important for this issue globally. And also it's gratifying to have the minister here uh, who really represents um, the power of government to enforce laws to protect uh, the environment um, in their countries and also um, to protect the economy. Um, I would say that where you have environmental degradation, often it's a result of a failure to enforce laws. Um, and that situation actually is exactly the same environment. The lawless environment is one that is conducive to slavery. And so you often find the confluence of the two, that they're intricately interwoven, that you find where you have environmental degradation, where you have the exploitation of the environment, the exploitation of people follows. And likewise, where you find slaves in the world today, um, you often find the degradation of the environment. And the common denominator, the common thing that's there is a lack of enforcement of law. And so IJM's mission around the world is to protect the poor from violence. And, and a lot of our work is to counter trafficking and human trafficking. Um, we do that by identifying individual cases, working collaboratively with, uh, with governments, to, to bring rescue and restoration to victims of trafficking, but also to prosecute uh, those that actually perpetrate this crime, this crime of human trafficking. And um, as we do that, we're able to work alongside justice systems to build up their own and strengthen their own response to the crime. And you know, this, um, the confluence of the environmental degradation and the degradation of human rights is just a space in which there's huge potential, I think, for coming together on this issue and from, from both perspectives. Um, and so what we have seen uh, as we've addressed this crime uh, here in Cambodia in a relatively new project, um, protecting Cambodians from the scourge of labor trafficking in the region, and also a new project in Thailand and Bangkok, 
which is directly focused on the fishing industry in Thailand. So what we've found is that um, we can have partnerships with, with, with private sectors who are engaged in the illegal fishing um, response and actually work together to strengthen law enforcement. And that's the, that's the key, that's the coin of the realm, that's really what needs to happen. The, the technology can be used to, to track ships, it can be used to track ship, uh, fishery um, products. Um, the, the work can be done to enforce regulations and laws on, on fishing um, vessels and, and ship captains. But that effort and that significant investment of resources will itself be denuded, will be undermined if you cannot uh, consistently bring to account in criminal justice systems those that are actually perpetrating violence against the migrant fishermen that tend to find themselves on these vessels. And so what we find is that uh, in a typical case, you know, you'll have a subsistence farmer somewhere in Cambodia or Myanmar or many other countries in the region looking for opportunities overseas. They're enticed overseas with the offer of good pay and a job not on a fishing boat because actually the word has got out, don't work on the fishing boats. But the, the broker will tell them you don't have to do that, we'll just work on the ports and um, they'll get there and they'll be taken across into these ports in places like Thailand where they're actually sold, physically sold, from broker to ship captain. And it's not until maybe they're 200 miles offshore that they actually realize the truth of what's happened to them. And they're on these large fishing, fishing vessels out on the high seas. Uh, it's a situation where they are really beyond the scope and reach of the law. And so if you can imagine a situation of abuse uh, where you're working 17 to 22 hour days where you know, you're often forced to take drugs so you can actually keep working where if you fall sick, there's no medical treatment. If you fall overboard, the ship captain is likely <coughs> just to keep on sailing. You know, more than half, the UN study showed more than half of fishermen in some of these industries have witnessed the murder of one of their uh, crewmates by a ship captain. So there's a huge amount of violence. And the economic pressures are there. The, uh, the connection with the environment is that as these ships have to go further and further afield to find catch, they're further away from, from the protections of the law that might be in these countries, but also there's a huge amount of pressure to profit. And so 17-hour days are the norm um, to force these men to work hard on these ships in, in, in degrading and completely um, slave-like conditions, essentially, which they can, they can just never escape from. There's no one to rescue them. There's no one to come and save them. And if we can just imagine that, there's a situation of of a lack of any legal protection. Um, and, and that's just uh, a situation of abject hopelessness for someone on a ship like that. And so really that's where IJM is, is um, passionate about in, uh, assisting and strengthening local law enforcement to bring to bear the power of the law and sophisticated criminal investigations using data, using technology, um, to, to bring accountability into a space right now where the fishing industry entertains very low risk in actually employing slaves. There are very few convictions, you can count them on one hand, of ship captains uh, for, for trafficking, for example, in Thailand. And so it's low risk, high profit, and actually, while it's low risk for these fishing companies, it's high risk for companies that are using those companies in their supply chains. And they assume the risk of that supply chain having slavery within it. And so that's where multinational companies can really bring to bear their leverage on these governments, their resources for these governments, to actually build their justice systems to respond and actually increase the risk for running slaves. And once you start to increase the risk, then you actually see the, the slavery reduce. And that's what we've seen around the world. And that's a successful uh, model of intervention where we would encourage that to, to happen in this, in this context as well. Minister, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Timor-Leste's collaboration with its neighbours on the, the human trafficking issue? Yes, we, uh, my colleagues, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs also here, we, uh, we, we do it through the Bali, uh, Bali Forum, process. Bali process, and it has been for, for, for many years or so. And the human trafficking is, is one of the issues one of the issues that we face in Timor-Leste. And we have cases in which people were caught and have to be repatriated. 
just an example of uh, one or two fishing boats that we caught in Timor Leste, Thai fishing boats, and we found uh, several uh, people from, from, uh, from many nationalities, mainly Indonesians, some of them from, uh, from other countries, uh, that, uh, that we believe that were, they were part of this uh, human trafficking mm. and a part of this activity. That's why any fishing boats in Timor Leste, the ones we give him, all the crew are registered, the passport, and it's all certified. For example, this, the fishing, the Chinese fishing boat, the old crew are registered, we know it, the passport, and then we have in every boat, Timur is there. Unfortunately, some Timuris couldn't put up with the, with the with staying too long, mm. and they had to uh, be back. But uh, uh, I, I, I agree with this, uh, as part of these activities, Fishing, illegal fishing activities, not only uh, uh, illegal fishing, human trafficking, and then as well as uh, as well as uh, um, narcotic traffic mm. that always take place as well. We caught a few boats with with, with the narcotics in Timor Leste, and then uh, and then they were they were taken to the court, and then uh, all the all the all the drugs were seized by the by the by the police, so this is the case, particularly in, the, in those areas, in the Arafura Timor Sea. From the satellite images, you could see a lot of illegal fishing activities. In our waters, it's diminishing now, but uh, we, we work collaboratively to eliminate all the fishing activities. Now that uh, everyone is, is looking at the area as um, to keep it as, a, as an area, because it's an area of high biodiversity. And that's why we're working very hard. But we're working very closely with our neighbors to shake all this. Australia, Indonesia, and then, uh, and then uh, PNG. But with the Bali Bali process, of course, this is an overall approach by the international community and regional to tackle this human, 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 human trafficking. So, uh Coming up next <coughs> month, uh, in June, there's the United Nations Ocean SDG Summit, and uh, one of the reasons for, for this briefing is that the forum uh, is working with its partners and to, uh, on a, uh, a traceability declaration around tuna, because as, as we know, tuna is one of the uh, almost nine, over 90% of tuna stocks have been depleted around the world. Uh, I'm just going to uh, use the last few minutes as a little bit of a commercial break on this traceability declaration because it's ex an exceedingly important uh, initiative. The Tuna 2020 traceability declaration, it's, it's a non-legally binding declaration that grew out of a forum such as this, uh, spurred by the President of the UN General Assembly's Ocean SDG Summit next month. Uh, the declaration is endorsed by leaders of the world's biggest retailers, tuna processors, marketers, traders and harvesters, uh, with the support of influential civil society organisations and governments. Uh, the, the entities endorsing the traceability declaration announced concrete actions and partnerships to implement the declaration. Uh, it's a hugely, you know, tuna management is a hugely complex and multi-jurisdictional challenge. Uh, as fish tuna are highly migratory, uh, they there are more than 70 countries, including Timor Leste, reporting tuna landings, uh, and the conservation and management of tuna fisheries are handled through five different intergovernmental tuna regional fisheries management organisations. So it's a, a, a hugely complex. Even coordinating amongst fisheries agencies is a complex thing. Uh, but tuna populations are at risk. The uh, commitments under this declaration are uh, to the, the tuna traceability commitment. We pledge that all tuna products in our supply chains will be fully traceable to the vessel and trip dates and that this information will be disclosed at the point of sale, either on the packaging or via an online system. So that's a hugely ambitious challenge. Uh, we have a commitment to a socially responsible tuna supply chain. Uh, we pledge to eliminate any form of slavery and ensure suppliers at least meet minimum social standards 
in management practices as recommended in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Labour Organization's conventions and recommendations. So that's a, an anti-slavery commitment there. Commitment to environmentally responsible tuna sourcing. Uh, so there needs to be robust science-based data management plans and measures to ensure that impacts of fisheries on the environment are sustainable, including bycatch mitigation techniques. Uh, and it's a government partnership, and I certainly hope we can have some, uh, some, some conversations around that with our, uh, the governments who are present here at, at the uh, World Economic Forum on ASEAN. Uh, in addition to the above commitments, as industry leaders, we call on and work with governments to take the actions that are needed to support them, which includes implementing harvest strategies for tuna stocks, uh, establish under, under, under all of the intergovernmental agencies that have uh, jurisdiction over tuna, establish systems to identify and restrict illegal seafood, uh, and to build capacity to establish and manage information systems to account for domestic and international fishing fleets. So this is all under um, uh, a forum project that's now being led from our San Francisco Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution because there are technology uh, implications on this. We have the new vision for ocean, uh, which is about uh, uh, improving ocean health and unlocking opportunity. And this is available on the forum's website and uh, any further information, uh, the environment team here at the World Economic Forum will be very pleased to help you with that. Uh, if I could thank our participants and perhaps ask for one or two last thoughts on each of your respective areas here. Yes, I, what I can say is that in Timor-Leste we are fully committed. It's a political commitment across the board on the necessity to protect our fish and resources. And we have a civil society which is very active. Sometimes they say things that are too emotional. But, uh, but uh, we, we work together. And then uh, I can tell you that uh, this government, the next government, and the next government will not allow any, any activity that will, will endanger our fishing, fishing resources. Timor Leste, uh, we haven't started tuna fishing yet. We did it for a short period, but all, all the tuners that migrate to Timor Leste have been fished elsewhere. Maybe in Indonesia, maybe some other country. But uh, I agree that uh, we fully agree, and then we are ready to to commit ourselves to help it. And then uh, the only thing that we we lack is the, the enough resources to have a full control of uh, of those illegal activities. And then once we have it, we'll do it, no matter how. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I would just congratulate the, um, the Oceans Project and the Tuna 2020 Declaration, I think, is really encouraging. It's an ambitious goal, that second commitment, which is to, I think, eliminate any form of slavery from the tuna fishing industry. Um, and I would just say to that, uh, just to reiterate, that from our experience, a strong and effective criminal justice system response is an essential part of the solution. To eliminate slavery, that's what you need. To acknowledge really what this is, and that is that this industry that employs slaves is a criminal enterprise using coercion and deception. And to dismantle, to dismantle that enterprise, you must bring to bear a sophisticated law enforcement response. And so as you push towards those goals in 2020, I'd encourage um, continual dialogue and also um, commitment and resources to building and strengthening criminal justice systems to respond to this human rights abuse, to this criminal enterprise that persists today. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. So clearly the message is it's a, hugely, it's a huge challenge. Uh, it's got environmental, social uh, challenges all along the supply chain and the way that we can tackle this is through collaboration between all of the stakeholders involved. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please come to the more list. I would like to come. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.